name is Michael Cosea. I have been a dentist for almost 36 years. So let's get started here. Okay, I'm coming, you to, coming today from the beautiful Northwest, uh, home of Multnomah Falls. That's a beautiful picture of Multnomah Falls where it is, oh, about 42 degrees and crummy right now. And it'll be like 42 degrees and crummy for the next, uh, oh, five to six months. But that's why it's so green and beautiful up in the Northwest. So a uh, little picture of the waterfall there. A uh, little disclosure, uh, we're gonna talk about laser products today. We're gonna talk about class four medical lasers or dental lasers. Uh, we're not gonna talk about taking moles off or tissue tags or things like that. We're gonna talk about how lasers can be used in dentistry and how they can be used safely and effectively in our offices. So the usual law uh, disclosure there. I have one more disclosure for you here. I'm a Green Bay Packer fan. I uh, hope that doesn't offend anybody. Uh, that's a nice picture of me and my wife a couple of years ago up at Lambeau Field. Uh, we went to see, actually saw the Packers play Seattle. And it was a balmy 13 degrees at game time. Uh, and they did uh, defeat uh, Seattle. And it was, a, it was a great time. So let's move on. A little about me. I purchased a, my first laser 21 years ago. Uh, why did I buy a laser? Because I wanted to change the way I was doing dentistry. Technology is constantly changing for dentistry. Obviously, uh, when I went to school, it was a little different. We were uh, dipping x-rays, and I think there was a guy named Branamark was talking about implants. Uh, Technology has changed dramatically. So over the last 21 years, I have uh, used uh, numerous types of lasers. Uh, I've trained hundreds of people uh, dentists, hygienists, how to use lasers. I've been a tester for uh, certain laser products. I've pretty much tried them all. Uh, right now, I am director of practice integration at BioLase. Uh, what does that mean? I go around to offices and help integrate lasers, help dentists learn and uh, incorporate lasers into their practices. Uh, I've written uh, numerous articles about laser incorporation and everyday use of lasers. Married to my wife, beautiful wife, Sandra. I have four kids, three gone, one to go. And I practice one day a week. I sold my practice about uh, six months ago and I worked back for the people that bought it. So just a little, little idea of me of what I do and, and how uh, lasers have become part of my, uh, my life. Now we talk about technology, okay? Dentistry obviously is constantly changing. Uh, with lasers, we're leading the technology revolution. Lasers are becoming the standard of care. You can do numerous, numerous procedures using lasers. Okay? And that's just, that's just gonna increase. Okay? That's, that's just changing the way it is. And as it changes, it leads to better care for our patients. Okay? And patients want better technology. Okay? The old uh, root canal joke or, or pull on tooth, uh, our pull on the tooth joke has changed. Patients' perception, they want better technology. And guess what? We're all patients, okay? Uh, I had a root canal about a month ago, and it was actually fine. I mean, it wasn't painful, it wasn't anything. I had a tooth that broke, uh, it becomes sort of bothersome, and I decided to have the root canal done before I put the crown on it. Uh, but we are all patients. Patients want to be safe, right? They want to know what's going on. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, they can go on the internet and find out all kinds of things about dentistry. And we have to be aware of that, whether it's good or bad. Whoa, there's a little case I, I used a laser for, just to wake you up there. That's a great case for a laser. It's a fibroma, a large fibroma on the tongue. Usually when we cut into the tongue, it bleeds, okay? And we have to suture it. In this case, we use the laser. We use the uh, a YSGG, a yttrium scandium gallium garnet laser, uh, the water lace I+. Uh, we remove this, there it is, uh, which can be biopsied when using a laser. Uh, that is immediate post-op. Now that sort of whitishness is what's called the laser band-aid, where we go over the area to help uh, uh, stimulate uh, healing and also uh, create coagulation. Now, here's really, really the amazing part of using a laser. That's a post-up on that case. 
that's 24 hours later, okay? So lasers are becoming part of dental treatment. Uh, there are different types of lasers. We're gonna talk about that. And obviously we wanna keep our patients and ourselves and our staff safe. Okay, so what, what can we use lasers for and how, how do we use lasers? And what about laser safety? All these things we're gonna talk about. Obviously common sense plays a big part in using any type of uh, instrument in dentistry, right? We use a scalpel, we use a high speed. There's certain precautions we use to make sure we're protected and our patients are safe when we use these instruments. So use a little common sense, universal precautions. When I was in dental school, we didn't wear gloves. We didn't wear masks. They were optional. Then there was this little thing that came around. It was called HIV. Wow, we, uh, we changed dramatically how we uh, treated our patients. And I wouldn't think of not using gloves, masks, or eyewear today when treating my patients. So just be aware that when you're using a laser, it's part of universal precautions. A few other things, always test fire your laser before you put it in the mouth. We always turn our high speed on before we put it in the mouth, make sure it's working, water's coming out. Obviously never point your laser at your eyes and read the manual. Equipment comes with instructions, with manuals. Read the manual, take a few minutes to learn what the instrument or how to use the instrument and what it contains in that manual. So what is a laser? This is a cool picture. That's a Theodore Maiman. Theodore Maiman came up with a ruby laser, I believe uh, in about 1962. So this laser stuff is not new. It's just been developed and it's become incorporated to use in dentistry. And as it's become incorporated, we've gotten lasers smaller, more efficient, more, you know, the ability to do different things has changed. But that's sort of a cool picture. That's uh, like I said, Theodore Maiman, 1962. Okay. So what is a laser? Laser is an acronym, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. What does that mean? That means we're going to create light, a beam of light, an invisible beam of light, okay? Uh, sort of hard to think of as dentists, we, we, we try to, you know, what do we do? We make holes, right? We make a hole, we fill it in. We prep a tooth, we put a crown on it. We do things that are very, very uh, physical. Now I'm gonna tell you that an invisible beam of light is going to interact with tissue and have a positive effect. So you gotta think a little differently. Keep an open mind when you think about using your laser. Okay, and that was first postulated by guess who? Albert Einstein, over a hundred years ago, the theory of, of laser was thought of over a hundred years ago by Albert Einstein. So now here we're gonna go through and I'm gonna, this little video that's gonna tell you uh, in a nutshell how a laser works. To make a laser, all you need to do is give a big collection of atoms enough energy so they're excited and ready to emit light. Once one of them spontaneously emits a photon, it'll stimulate some of the others to do so and you get a nice cascade of illumination. But instead of letting all the light escape, it's more powerful to trap it between two mirrors and let it bounce back and forth through the atoms. All that passing light will stimulate them to emit even more light, and as long as you keep on re-exciting the atoms, they're happy to go on emitting light forever. But why do the atoms emit light just because another photon passes by? It's actually pretty simple. Imagine flipping two coins. They can either be in the same state or in different states. But photons aren't like coins. No matter how hard you try, you can't tell one apart from another. So in a photon flipping experiment, that means there's only one way for them to be in different states, but two ways for them to be in the same state. So they're more likely to be in the same state. And in general, this implies that photons always want to be like other photons, to have the same phase, polarization, and go in the same direction. And what's more amazing is that if a solitary photon passes by an excited atom that could emit another photon, there's a good chance it will emit one, because the two photons want to be together, even before the second one exists. So once you have all these friendly photons bouncing around between the mirrors, you can just open up a little hole at the end and let out a blinding stream of coherent light, a laser beam. To see lasers in action, check out this sweet episode of Smarter Every Day, showing a laser you can stick your hand inside. They also have a bunch of other cool science videos. So 
how does a laser actually, after watching that little video, how does it actually work? Well, we have an active medium, okay? Uh, what is an active medium? It could be a crystal, it could be a chamber of sealed gas in the case of a CO2 laser. In the case of a YSGG laser, it could be, uh, it's a yttrium scandium gallium garnet crystal, okay? Uh, erbium YAG is an erbium yttrium aluminum garnet crystal. When this crystal is electrically stimulated, it causes a change in the configurations of the atoms. Now, what does that mean? Let's go back to physics. Uh, <clears throat> we have an atom with a nucleus and electrons in orbit around it. When, that, when those atoms are electrically stimulated, those electrons are pushed out of their original orbit into an outlying orbit. They don't like that. They spontaneously decay back into the original orbit. By doing that, they cause other electrons that are being electrically stimulated to be pushed in and out of orbit. When this is done, these electrons release energy. That energy is released in the form of light energy or photons. Those photons are reflected on mirrors, uh, formed or, or, or shaped into a beam. That beam goes through a fiber, through a handpiece, through a tip, voila, you have a laser and it interacts with certain tissues, okay? There's a lot of different lasers out there, CO2 lasers, anti-AG lasers, uh, diode lasers, A10, 980 nanometer, 940 uh, diode wavelength lasers, uh, erbium YAG lasers, and of course the YSGG laser or the water lace laser. Different lasers are absorbed at different rates into specific tissue types, okay? The main targets of uh, YSGG lasers or erbium YAG lasers is water and hydroxyapatite. That's why these lasers can cut or interact in a blade tooth. Okay? Main targets of diode lasers, melanin and hemoglobin or pigment. Uh, di diode lasers can be used to treat uh, puffy gums and periodontal disease. Uh, it has an adjunct to scaling and root planing. Why? Because that tissue, inflamed tissue, is more has more melanin, more inflammation in it, more blood in it, and it reacts or the laser reacts with that tissue to help remove it and clean it up. So different lasers interact with different types of tissue. Now lasers can have four effects on tissue. They can be, laser energy can be reflected. And we have to know about this because if that energy is reflected and it's an invisible beam, where's it going? How far is it going? Okay. From a safety standpoint, we have to know this. Laser energy can be transmitted. It can travel through one tissue unchanged and interact with an underlying tissue. One of the coolest things I've ever done with a laser, a diode laser, was I treated a capillary hemangioma of the tongue. What's a capillary hemangioma? It's just a purple uh, capillary bed. It's very purplish and dark colored. I used a diode laser. The laser energy went through the outer tissue of the tongue and photocoagulated that dark capillary purplish tissue. And then the body over time broke it down and removed it. So we removed a capillary hemangium of the tongue without ever cutting into the tongue. Really cool, some of the things lasers can do. Laser energy can be scattered, okay? The energy can be scattered and just diffused into tissue. And laser energy can be absorbed, like I said earlier, it can be absorbed in certain types of tissue. And if it is, it can interact or blade that tissue in the case of a uh, filling or, or a, a preparation on a tooth. Okay. There's just a couple of pictures, some different lasers. We have the I plus on the right, we have a diode, uh, the epic diode in the middle, and we have the uh, uh, water lace express on the, uh, I'm sorry, on the right side. Uh, different lasers uh, do different things. Now, let's start talking a little about laser safety. You're going to hear uh, a few times about ANSI, A-N-S-I. Okay, we'll talk about that. And certain things that should be done on a laser in, in an office to make our laser safe for us, our patients, and our staff. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about specific eyewear, high volume evacuation, high filtration masks. Oh, look at that, universal precautions again. And always use the lowest power necessary. You know, if you're starting to use a laser, it doesn't 
It's not a problem to start low. You can always turn the power up. Laser energy is very controlled. You're very precise with using it. So it's very safe. But if you haven't used it or it's new to you, you can start a little lower. and You can always bump it up as needed. We'll also talk about a laser safety officer. Oh, and there's our laser danger sign. It's a little uh, intimidating, but we should be posting a sign outside the operatory we're using a laser in because there's visible or, like I said, invisible light, radiation that's being exposed to our patients. Now, that doesn't mean that if I'm working in the operatory and someone walks by the, the door of the operatory and sticks their head and says, hey, what are you doing, that they're going to be affected but we do need to set, set areas and boundaries for proper uh, safety of our, our patients and our staff. So when using a laser, you should be posting a laser uh, uh, in use sign or laser danger sign. Okay. I'll talk a little about lasers. Let's start with diode lasers. Okay, diode lasers are very common. Uh, I think about 50% of dental offices have diode lasers. Okay. Diode lasers have been around for a long time. They've been used safely for years and years. Uh, they've been used in, in hygiene for cellular debridement. They've been used to uh, recontour gingival tissue, uh, phrenectomies, uh, fibromas, all kinds of uh, soft tissue. Uh, and these have been around and they're very, very safe. There's really, really no contraindications patient-wise for using a diode laser that can be used safely on a pregnant uh, uh, patient's uh, they can be used around implants uh, if used efficiently or in the right mode. Uh, so really, really, uh, diode lasers have been very safe. But because diode lasers do create invisible energy and it is reflected and it does seek pigment, we have to be aware that we have to wear specific eyewear to protect ourselves. Okay. Diodes can have an effect on the eyes. Again, when they say don't point the laser right at your eye, not only from the diode standpoint, the diode energy, but these lasers also contain uh, laser pointers, okay? If they have a red or yellow or orange, some have green beams coming out, that's not the actual laser. That is a laser pointer to help direct or show you where the energy is uh, being directed. You'd never point a laser uh, pointer at someone's eye. So just think of that when you do that, okay? And like I said, uh, ener uh, this energy can be reflective. Uh, it can interact with different types of tissue. And each one of these lasers, because they're invisible, we don't know the exact, you know, where the angulation or, or if they're being reflected. So you need to know your NOHD, your nominal ocular hazardous distance. And we're gonna talk about that and the differences between different types of lasers, okay? Now, if you did use lasers improperly and uh, pointed them at your eyes or, or did things and did not wear your glasses, what could be some of the possible effects? Well, you could cause damage to your eye. You could cause watering the eye. You could cause floaters. You could get headaches from using this. Long term, you could cause permanent damage, irreversible damage to, to your eyes. Okay. So, while I've not seen any studies that have shown dentist uh, or, or permanent damage to dentist's eyes using a laser, I say, don't be the first, okay? A little common sense using common or, or specific uh, uh, glasses for your laser and you're gonna protect yourself, your staff and your patient. Okay. A few more uh, terms to know, maximum uh, permissible exposure refers to the level of laser radiation, which an unprotected person may be exposed to without experiencing adverse biological change to the eye or skin. Uh, nominal hazardous zone uh, refers to the space within which the MPE is being exceeded. And OD, or optical density, refers to the opacity of the laser protective material in the eyewear. What does that mean? Your glasses are going to be rated. Uh, your safety glasses are going to have a uh, either uh, stamped or, or something on the glasses, not only saying the wavelengths they protect against, but they'll have an OD rating. The OD rating should be four or greater. Four or greater will protect you and will minimize that, that uh, 
diode or, or in the case of any laser, that energy to one ten thousandth of the laser light that's transmitted through through the glasses. So it's going to create or, or change your ON or your NOHD to a very, very minimal couple of millimeters. Okay. And we talk about a laser safety officer. Okay, what is a laser safety officer? Well, I've not seen a specific OSHA requirement for a laser safety officer. There should be someone in the office who's put in charge of taking care of the lasers. What does that mean? That means educating your patients, uh, educating your staff. If you get a new staff member, how to use the laser and what safety precautions are needed, uh, how to clean the laser, okay? How to take care of the laser, um, who's in the room, um, how the laser should be put together, what tips are needed, all these things should be uh, the, the use of the laser safety officer to take care of so it's used, so lasers are used properly. And like I said, train workers, or train someone new that comes in and, and clean, clean the laser, clean the, uh, clean the glasses. Okay. And laser safety principles, okay, recognize the nominal hazardous zone for that laser, place warning signs outside the operatory. For me, the, the nominal, nominal hazardous zone is the operatory. If we're using a laser in an operatory, everyone in that operatory has glasses on. If they do not have glasses on, they're not in the operatory. It's that simple, okay? So the patient, the assistant, and the operator should all have specific glasses on for that type of laser, okay? And make sure those glasses have an OD rating of four or, or greater, okay? If multiple wavelengths are used in an office, say you have an Urban YAG or YSG laser and a diode, you need specific glasses for each one of those lasers, okay? Even with proper eye protection, never look directly at the laser beam, okay? Uh, we wanna protect ourselves, okay? We wanna protect our patients. The rule is the patient's the first one to get the glasses on, the last one to take them off, okay? Everyone in the operatory has safety glasses or laser safety glasses on, or they're not in the operatory. It's a real, real simple rule. Okay. So what is an NOHD? An NOHD, like I said earlier, is a nominal ocular hazardous distance, okay? And it varies. That's the theoretical distance that that laser or that wavelength could have an effect on tissue. And I listed some of those uh, NOHDs here for different types of lasers. For the I plus, the water lace, it's about five centimeters. Also for the water lace express. Okay, those are 2780 nanometer lasers. Five centimeters is the NOHD. Uh, the EPIC 940 nanometer diode laser has an NOHD of almost five meters, okay? So that's a little, little greater area. Uh, EPIC Hygiene, which is a 980 nanometer uh, diode laser, has about half a meter. Uh, and then just a couple of other lasers, uh, CO2 lasers are about, oh, they're about 2.4 to 2.5 meters. And the erbium YAGs are anywhere from one to six meters, depending on the handpiece and uh, how the laser energy is diffused. Okay, so you should know your nominal ocular hazardous distance. If you have a laser and you don't know it, it will be in that little manual back in the specifications for your laser. Okay, so take a little time to learn and read that little manual that comes with your specific laser. Okay, safety glasses, okay. Safety glasses will be provided by the manufacturer, usually three pair per laser. With BioLace, the diode glasses that are provided cover all the diode wavelengths. So you don't need different glasses for different diode lasers. Other companies might have wavelength specific glasses for their wavelength. What does that mean? If they make an 810 diode laser, it's only for an 810. It's not for a 940 or a 980. Whereas the BioLace glasses should cover from 810 all the way up to 980. Uh, what about if you wear loops, okay? If you have loops, I always say contact your loops manufacturer first. 
a lot of the loop manufacturers are creating or uh, uh, making inserts for their specific loops they sell. If they don't, uh, Innovative Optics is a company that does make inserts. Uh, also, Viewmax Solutions is another company that makes uh, a little inserts that go inside your, your uh, loops and protect you depending on the wavelength you're using. Uh, so, just like in this picture, when you're working on your uh, pet dinosaur's teeth, uh, make sure you have your glasses on you and your pet dinosaur. Okay, here's just a couple pictures, like you said, some different, uh, you can see where the wavelength uh, and the optical dentistry, optical density is actually printed or, or uh, on the glasses. Okay, this one has an ODF greater than five, okay. Uh, here's just some different, uh, you can see there's some, some inserts here or uh, on the end. Again, you know, uh, for, for your specific loops, call your loop manufacturer and that's a great way of finding out uh, if they offer it or if you need to go to another uh, manufacturer. But make sure when you're wearing loops, you have proper protection. And that brings up uh, one other question. I'm gonna go back to the, how do you clean your laser glasses, okay? Do not cabicide your laser glasses. It could damage over time, it could damage the film that protects you. So we just use uh, soap and water, a little Windex, something like that, but do not cabicide your glasses. Okay, and like I said, always test fire your laser. Uh, you, turn your la uh, you turn your high speed on before you uh, put it into the patient's mouth to make sure it's working, make sure water's coming out. It's no different whether using a all tissue laser like the I plus, uh, you wanna make sure the water's coming out, you wanna make sure the laser's firing, or if it's a diode laser, you wanna make sure it's, it's firing. So always test fire your laser before placing it into the patient's mouth. Okay. Now, lasers can produce heat. Diode lasers cut by vaporizing tissue. I know that doesn't sound real great, but they do, okay? And as you put more energy or more power into a diode laser, it's going to cause more heat thermal damage uh, to the surrounding tissue. Now, the thermal damage is nowhere near uh, that what's put out by a electrosurge, but still, we wanna minimize that thermal damage because if we have less thermal damage, tissue is going to heal better. Patient's going to have less uh, pain or, or post-op uh, sensitivity following a procedure. So just remember, you can always turn your laser up, okay? So start low and turn it up as needed as you're learning. If you turn it way up, you're gonna get carbonization, charring, blackening of the tissue. We don't really want that, okay? So just remember that and start, start low and adjust the laser as needed. Okay, what about contraindications for using the laser? Uh, NO2 with diode lasers. Uh, this is from ANSI, I found this. NO2 can be used in the dental care of patients with caution in nasal inhalation and proper scavenging equipment. Okay, and you can look that up with ANSI. Uh, so that's, that says you can use um, uh, lasers with uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, one, uh, contraindication is don't wipe your diode laser tips with alcohol during use because that could, when you heat that up, it could uh, ignite that. And also know your patient's health history, okay? While lasers are proven to cause less bleeding and, and uh, less post-op, remember, look at your patient's health history. If your patient's on a, a, a blood thinner, I always contact the uh, primary care physician to see if we need to adjust the blood thinner. Uh, don't think just because it's a laser and it causes less bleeding that you might not create a problem if they are on a blood thinner. So it's better to be safe, like they say, it's better to be safe than sorry. Okay. Uh, what about laser use around implants? Uh, here, I'll show you a couple of my implant cases. Oh, that's a good one. What about, oh, holy smokes. No, these aren't mine. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting some of the things you come across over the years that uh, friends share. Uh, this is an interesting case. Uh, there's a few broken implants up here, broken here, a couple uh, full size, a lot of minis. The interesting thing about uh, 
let's get back to that one, is uh, all the tooth material was made out of composite onto these implants. Quite interesting. Uh, fortunately, this doctor is no longer practicing. Here's another case. Do you think they put enough implants in there? Uh, more is better is not necessarily a key word here, but uh, I like to show you a few things, wake you up a little bit. Uh, but that gets back to, can we use laser around an implant? And it's actually a really cool thing because the YSGG lasers, the uh, I plus lasers, has specially designed tips. It's called an SFT, a side firing tip. It's eight millimeters. Uh, it directs the laser energy laterally to interact with the exposed threads when treating periimplantitis to clean and disinfect the implant surface. To my knowledge, this is the only laser tip, only or the only way to properly clean the exposed threads when you have bone loss uh, due to periimplantitis. And there's numerous studies that have shown that these YSGG lasers, yeah, like I said, the water lakes I plus can clean and disinfect implant surfaces, actually leading to reattachment. Uh, here's one study I put up here. It was laser-assisted surgical treatment of periimplantitis with a one-year re-entry and 18-month follow-up. Uh, that's the author's name. Uh, there's numerous other articles out there, and you can just Google some of this or go to PubMed and uh, see the uh, results of some of these. But it's, it's actually sort of cool that we have a tool now that can actually clean the surface and disinfect the surface of the implant. Okay, what about sterilization and care of our, our, our laser uh, components? Uh, Hand pieces can be sterilized. Uh, usually hand pieces can re be removed from the fiber uh, or from the laser. Uh, there's specific uh, uh, ways to sterilize depending on the type uh, and the manufacturer. So again, read your manual as far as what they recommend, how to sterilize it, what setting, whether to bag it or not bag it. Uh, you can use barrier techniques to cover some of the smaller diode lasers. Uh, cover the screen so you don't touch the screens because you really don't want to cavicide the screens. Uh, a lot of these touch screens, uh, you don't want to cavicide them uh, because over time it could damage that, that touch screen. And that's what's happening with lasers. They're becoming more technologically advanced with touch screens and ease of use. Uh, tips are usually disposed of in a sharps container. So when you're done, whether it's, it's a disposable tip, uh, it would be removed from the laser, whether it's a diode or a YSGG tip, uh, if it's a disposable tip and it would be placed in the sharps container. If it is a reusable tip, in which the case for the YSGG, there are some tips that are reusable, uh, those tips can be sterilized and reused. And like I mentioned earlier, cleaning of laser safety glasses and the rest of your equipment, uh, the laser safety glasses, uh, soap and water, a little Windex, just uh, uh, gentler material or gentler solutions than uh, cavicide. Do not use cavicide on the uh, laser safety glasses. Uh, as far as cleaning a fiber, uh, you could cavicide these. Uh, as far as cleaning uh, any other handles on your uh, laser, you can't cavicide that equipment. Okay, ANSI, we talked about ANSI, A N S I, American National Standards Institute. Uh, if you go to ANSI, they'll have a lot of information. Uh, the information will talk about uh, standards for uh, uh, sterilization, standards for use, standards for safety, uh, with numerous, not just lasers, but with everything. But they do, uh, they do cover laser uh, care and safety issues. So that's a great place to start looking for uh, information if you want further information. And like I said, ANSI's facilitates the development of, of the American National Standards, is accredited the procedures of standards, developing organizations and approving their documents as American National Standards. That's a mouthful. But what it does is it gives you guidance on how to take care of equipment, how to use equipment properly. Uh, it brings up the fact that you know, our patients trust us as, as dental professionals. And, and they should. I mean, we should uh, provide a 
clean, safe environment for our patients. Uh, as they come into our office, especially during COVID, uh, there's been a, a lot of, 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 of uh, information directed about what is good and what is bad. Uh, so we need to reassure our patients that we are providing a clean, safe environment for their dental care. And when we use lasers, we have to think about that because lasers sort of get a bad rap. Uh, most people get their idea of how a laser works by watching movies or TV shows, right? And it usually doesn't, usually doesn't have a good ending. Uh, so you have to be aware that most patients think of lasers emitting a lot of heat. In the case of the water laser, the water laser, laser uses water to cut tooth and bone. It does not cause any increase or thermal damage to our tissues, which is great. Uh, so we just have to educate our patients a little bit of how we're using lasers to provide a next level of care for them. Okay? Now, laser equipment, uh, depending again on the type of laser, has a lot of little safety devices built into the laser. Emergency stop buttons. You'll notice that all lasers have an emergency stop button. It's a little red button. Uh, are you ever going to hit the emergency stop button and oh my gosh, hit the emergency stop button, stop? Of course not. But you might hit it inadvertently. Uh, you might hit it uh, on some lasers with your knee. Uh, you might hit it when picking up or moving the laser. If you do, you just press it in again and you reset it. Okay? Some lasers have keys, physical keys that once removed, the laser cannot operate. Other lasers have software codes or software keys, passwords uh, that you have to enter. Uh, all lasers have covered foot pedals. Why is that? Just to protect your foot uh, from inadvertently stepping on the pedal when you're not, or not prepared to use it. Uh, but they do have standby, standby modes. Standby mode, uh, you have to be in a ready mode for the laser to go. It's just another safety safety uh, device. And some have what's called a remote interlock device. A remote interlock device is something that is plugged into the laser and once it's removed or if it's pulled out of the laser, it, the laser cannot function, okay? So these are all, some, or these are some of the safety devices. There's others, uh, but that's, that's a, a pretty good list of all of the safety devices. And then you see on the bottom again, common sense, okay? Lasers are very precise, they're very controlled, okay? Uh, but we still have to use a little common sense. If you turn that laser up, like I said earlier, and, and turn it up all the way up, all the way, and there's a lot of heat generated, could it, could it cause tissue damage? Yes, it could. Yes, it could. So we have to become familiar with the different tools we use and a laser is just another one of those tools. Okay. Oh, what about documentation of the chart? Okay. We also have to document that we're using a laser. It's easy to get, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're tired, you're doing charts. You know, it's, it's, it's real easy to skip, but don't. If I can give you a little advice after 35 years of doing dentistry, please, please take the time to document your chart no matter what you're doing, okay? Patient wore wavelength specific safety glasses during treatment, most important part of documentation. Why? Because patients sometimes they associate lasers with eyewear or with uh, LASIK. And, and you don't want them to think that that laser for good or bad, uh, is having some sort of effect on their eye. It's not going to, but again, just protect yourself. You should also document the power and power or wattage that you're using. Uh, if you have a pulse rate, uh, you should document that, the air and water uh, for like the eye plus or, or some of the lasers in the case of a, a diode are using a continuous wave or a pulse wave. And what is that pulse setting? Uh, it's important to document that just for records, but it's also important to document that if you have to go back to that patient to do further treatment and you can say, well, that setting worked really well for that patient. So just be aware of that and document, take the time, take the time to document your chart. Okay, further research on laser safety. Again, ANSI, you can look for uh, 
Here's some of the articles uh, guidance for the safe use of lasers in dentistry, uh, laser safety in dentistry, uh, laser hazards and safety in dental practice. Uh, here's a, a few uh, articles I found that you can uh, look up. Obviously, you can uh, Google and find uh, more uh, articles. Uh, what could happen? Uh, uh, improper use of a laser, improper setting. Uh, in 99% of uh, instances, we would not use our high-speed drill without water. Because if we did, we could cause heat or thermal damage to a tube, right, or bone. Guess what? If we're using a laser to cut tooth or bone, we're going to be using water because we don't want to create heat. So again, this, this common sense approach, if you start to see any uh, browning or discoloration in the tooth, Turn the water up. You know, we have a simple rule. Turn the water up, or if the tissue turns brown, turn the power down. Okay. <laughs> I know it sounds simple, but just think about what you're trying to create, what, what result you're trying to get when you're using a laser, just like you do when you're using a high speed, a scalpel, a cavitron, any other instrument. And when used properly, you're not going to create a problem. Okay. So, Lasers are safe. Lasers are very safe. Educate your staff. Educate your patients. Okay? Uh, staff, uh, they might be uninformed or about how lasers work. They might have heard something. Uh, you want to protect your staff. Okay? Just because a laser beam is invisible doesn't mean it theoretically couldn't have an effect on someone's eyes if used long term improperly. Okay? So, Safety glasses, uh, proper care of the laser, sterilization of the of parts or the tips, removal, uh, disposal of the tips, education of our patients. All these things are part of utilizing a laser in a dental office. And I like to say that because laser safety is everybody's responsibility. You, you knew I was gonna show a picture of Dr. Evil there in his little uh, mini me. Couldn't, couldn't get away with this without doing that. Now, we've talked a lot about a lot, lot of different things. Uh, obviously, I haven't covered everything because we could spend days. I'm sure you could get a uh, master's degree in laser safety. Uh, there's so many, so many little things depending on the type of laser. A few things I want you to get out of this, which I'm going to reiterate again. Lasers are safe when used properly, okay? Educate your staff, educate your patients, okay? Uh, take proper care of your lasers. What about calibration? I would recommend calibration of your laser once a year, okay? To make sure it's putting out the power level that you think it is, okay? And that's just, you can have that through your manufacturer. You can call them, make sure it's working properly, okay? Think about what you're trying to use this laser for. And if you do, you will have great results uh, and you will change the way you're doing dentistry. Technology's here to stay, okay? Not that uh, what we're using uh, concepts are, are good, but technology's changing. Lasers are becoming the standard of care. Uh, with that, I'm going to invite you to uh, email me. You see my uh, email address there, uh, my phone number. Uh, you can call me, you can email me with any questions. I know. Uh, this is going to be sent out to you. It wasn't, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do it live, uh, but it'll be sent out to you and you can call me or email me at any time, whether you have a safety, laser safety question, or if you have a laser uh, clinical procedural question, I would be glad to help you out. I've used most of the different lasers that are out uh, and I have a pretty good uh, perception of what you can and can't do. But just keep an open mind and enjoy the technology that we've created and use it for the betterment of your patients. So at that, I will thank you for attending or uh, listening to this, and then I welcome your questions.